Detail. Hey, salute. Ready? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace and peace of God our Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My brothers and sisters, 39 years ago, in the waters of baptism, our brother Chris died with Christ. He rose with Christ to new life. May Chris now share with the Lord Jesus Christ eternal glory.
Let us pray. Into your hands, O Lord, we humbly entrust our brother Chris. In this life, you embraced him with your tender love. Deliver him now from every force of evil. Bid him to enter eternal rest. The old order has passed away. Welcome him then into paradise, where there will be no sorrow, no weeping or pain, but the fullness of your peace and joy. With your Son, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. My friends, I'll ask you now if you would kindly be seated. And at this time, I'd like to invite Cameron to come forward to proclaim the reading from the Old Testament. There is an appointed time for everything, and a time for every affair under the heavens. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot that plant. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to tear down, and a time to build. A time to weep, and a time to laugh a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to be far from embraces, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I'd now like to invite Russell to come forward and to proclaim the second reading from the New Testament. Reading from the letter of Paul, the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Put on them, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If one has a grievance against another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so must you also do. And over all these put on love that is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you were also called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, to everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, the word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks to God. God. be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Before the feast of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. He loved his own in the world, and he loved them to the end. The devil had already induced Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot, to hand him over. So during supper, fully aware that the Father had put everything into his power and that he had come from God and was, and was returning to God, he rose from supper and took off his outer garments. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will understand later. And Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, Unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Master, that not only my feet, but my hands and head as well. And Jesus said to him, Whoever has bathed has no need except to have his feet washed, for he is clean all over. So you are clean, but not all. For he knew who would betray him. And for this reason he said, 
not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and put his garments back on and reclined the table again, he said to them, do you realize what I have done for you? You call me teacher and master, and rightly so, for indeed I am. If I, therefore the master and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you a model to follow, so that as I have done for you, you should also do. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Would you all please be seated. Mayor de Blasio, Commissioner Nigro. Commissioner, the FDNY has been uppermost in our prayers of late. Your department has yet again suffered tragic loss of life. And we're mindful that along with Chris, so many other members of your department have been laid to rest these past several days. So this parish community, and I think you know, across this great state and city, you're very much in the prayers of so many people. To Congressman Zeldin and the representatives of our federal, state, and local governments, to Bishop Coyle, the personal representative of our bishop, John Barris, to my brother priest, especially our FDNY chaplains and our military chaplain, to the members of the FDNY, the Armed Forces of the United States, to Carmela, Mila, Eva, John, and Laura, Tony, Teresa, to the members of Chris's family, either by birth or by marriage, and friends. So many friends. Christopher Joseph Raguso was born to John and Laura on the 14th day of March, 1979. He was baptized at St. Bartholomew's Church in Elmhurst, Queens on the 16th of June, 1979. He was married in this church to Carmela de Chiara on the 25th of April, 2009. He returned home to God on the 15th of March, 2018, the day after his 39th birthday. A lot of energy, passion, enthusiasm, a sense of purpose, and always love went into those 39 years. I'll leave it to Commissioner Nigro to speak about Chris's life as a member of the FDNY, where Chris was honored multiple times for bravery and life-saving actions. And I'll leave it to his longtime friend Chris to speak about those personal qualities and virtues that distinguished Chris as the hero we honor today. And lastly, defer to his dad, John speak about Chris in a way that few could possibly do. I'd like for a few moments to reflect with you on Chris's death in the context of these days that we call holy. On Thursday evening, as Chris's wake was underway, our parish, like so many others, were gathered in this church celebrating the Mass of the Lord's Supper remembering the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples the night before he died, the gospel that our deacon just proclaimed. And at that supper, Jesus rose from the table and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. And with that simple action, 
Jesus' forever linked participation at this table with service of one another, that we minister to one another, that we care for one another without distinction. I have given you a model to follow, as I have done for you, so you must do for each other. This is the new commandment of Jesus, that we follow his example by serving one another. Chris had this commandment hardwired into his psyche. It was in his DNA. Whether as a member of New York's bravest, or our Air National Guard, he knew that he was called, charged, sent forth to be of service to others. And there are thousands more like him here in this church, lining the streets outside, at firehouses, precincts, military installations, thousands more across this nation who, like Chris, have answered that mandatum, that commandment, as I have done for you, you do for one another. Those brave souls who every day don a uniform and they go forth to serve so that others may live. Chris and those like him, in whatever capacity they serve, you have probably noticed are quick to brush aside the praise that we give them, the embarrassed way in which they seem to shuffle their feet or lower their head. When we say thank you, thank you for your service to our state, to our city, to our local communities, to our nation. Thank you. They brush away so quickly the title of hero with which we label them. But they are heroes. Quite unlike so many, the popular culture proposes as worthy of emulation. These are our real and lasting heroes. And for this simple reason, celebrities show off. Heroes show up. Chris always showed up. Whether it was the fire whistle of the Comac Fire Department, the alarm bell of the FDNY houses where he served, or the call to once again serve our nation in time of need. Chris always showed up. On a lighter note, Chris even answered the call to serve here in our parish community. On one occasion when Carmela wasn't able to teach their daughter's religious education class, a classroom full of energetic girls and rambunctious boys she pressed Chris into service. And afterwards, Chris told her, it's one of the toughest assignments he ever showed up for. <laughs> and last December, from this, from this pulpit, I watched him slip into church through that door, into that pew right there, to watch his little girls in our parish's Christmas pageant. He always showed up. Celebrities show off, but heroes show up. We honor one today, but indeed in honoring Chris, we honor all those who are like him. But there are unsung heroes as well, those who are hidden from public sight, families that support them those who are behind them all the way. John, on that Friday morning, you probably recall saying to me that Chris was your hero. 
And I said to you, he had to learn it from somewhere. John, John said he learned it from his mother. You're a smart man, John. He learned it from you and Laura. The two of you began the foundation for the life of service, the washing of others' feet that Chris lived in such an exemplary way. You began that journey in the example that you gave him and taught him. Carmela, all those times running out the door. I'll be right back. All those times, well, you might have shown up a little late or might have forgotten to do something that you told him to do. Chris's ability to respond to the needs of others was made possible because of the way that you stood behind him along with your daughters. Each of you in your own way, his family. You made it possible in the way that you loved him to be able to do what he did. You know, inescapably, this life of service, the washing of others' feet, it's going to bring us into an encounter with the cross. To live this life, to pattern our lives on the example of Jesus, it will bring us to the cross, which we remembered yesterday, with all of its pain, its suffering, its agony, and its heartbreak. And Chris came face to face with the reality of the cross while he was in service to others. He saw firsthand the suffering and the injustice of this world, whether in active duty while deployed overseas or while helping to relieve the suffering of those affected by natural disasters here in our own nation. And like Christ on that first Good Friday, the shadow of the cross found Chris and his six brothers in the skies over Iraq. And so now, we are like that faithful group of believers on a Saturday so many centuries ago. Those disciples who were grieving for Jesus. This Saturday, we are just like them, the very same day of the week, sitting in stunned silence and heartbroken But there's tomorrow. There's tomorrow. They couldn't have known that then. But we know it now. There's Easter. And Chris, he's part of that Easter mystery now. Indeed, he always has been. Since he was baptized at St. Bartholomew's 39 years ago. Carmela, on that awful morning the day after Chris died, your dad said to me that when the time comes, he wants to ask God, why? And I suppose we've all said, or we've prayed something similar to that these past two weeks. And I said to your dad, when the time comes, why won't matter anymore? It will be Easter. And our story, and Chris's story, will be Jesus' story. It'll be Easter forever. Like that first group of believers on an unmatched Sunday so many centuries ago, why won't matter anymore? My friends, I'll ask now if you would please stand. And at this time, I'd like to invite Stephen to come forward.
Christ is our good shepherd who gives his life to save those he loves. And in our loss, we now turn to him with confidence. And we make our needs known to him. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. Christopher fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. May he now receive from Christ the crown of eternal glory, which Jesus won for us with his death and resurrection. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Christopher's family, that in these difficult and dark days, they may be, they may be sustained by their faith and by the knowledge that they will be reunited with Christopher one day in God's heavenly kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the members of our Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, Air Force, and National Guard, that God will protect them, guide them, and bring them home safely, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who serve to protect others, especially the members of the Fire Department of the City of New York, for our local fire departments, particularly Chris's colleagues from the Comac Fire Department, that God will protect them, guide them, and bring them home safely, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the faithful departed, our relatives and friends, and in particular, all those who died with Chris, we remember. Captain Mark Weber, Captain Andres O'Keefe, Captain Christopher Zanettis, Staff Sergeant Deshaun Briggs, Master Sergeant William Posh, Staff Sergeant Carl Ennis, that they may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, may you support us all the day long till the shadows lengthen and the evening falls and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. And then in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. My friends, would you please be seated.
Now I'd like to introduce Commissioner Daniel Nigro. Thank you, Father, and thank you for that beautiful and powerful homily. A hero is a person who was admired for their courage, outstanding achievements, or their noble qualities. In my estimation, there's no one word that more aptly describes the extraordinary man we gather to honor and to remember today. Lieutenant Christopher Raguso was a hero in every sense of the word, and in every way he lived his life, he was a hero for our department. For 13 years, the majority of it spent at Ladder Company 113 on Rogers Avenue in Brooklyn. Chris responded day and night to countless calls for help, showing courage and showing conviction every time the alarm sounded. On six different occasions, he was recognized for his bravery or his life-saving actions. And two years ago, he had taken the next step in what was an already outstanding career. He had earned a promotion to lieutenant, where he would not only be able to continue his life-saving work, he would now be leading his fellow firefighters, helping to instill the same values he held so dear into that next generation of the FDNY. Off-duty, when not protecting the residents of New York City, he protected his hometown as well. As a volunteer in the Comac Fire Department, he raced to help others at a moment's notice. He brought his tremendous training and unwavering commitment with him on those calls, working day and night to protect his neighbors. Chris was truly beloved in his wonderful community, as evidenced by the yellow ribbons in his honor found everywhere throughout the town. He was without question admired, perhaps most by his young brother-in-law, Anthony. Chris's tremendous record of service inspired Anthony to join our department, where he currently serves as an EMT. In just a few months, he will enter our probationary firefighter's school to follow in Chris's enormous footprints. And when Chris was not responding through the streets of Brooklyn or Comac, bravely fighting fires, he went far beyond the borders of his home as a master sergeant in the New York Air National Guard. He deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan and courageously flew into combat zones to rescue wounded American service members. Make no mistake, many Americans who bravely defend our nation are alive today because of Chris's heroic actions. Away from the battlefield, Chris also responded to Texas and the Caribbean rescuing stranded civilians from the destruction caused by Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. He protected our country from foreign enemies and from the worst Mother Nature had to offer. Chris committed himself to saving others in every single aspect of his life. And just weeks ago, this incredible hero's life ended far too soon. Chris made the supreme sacrifice alongside his fellow service members, Staff Sergeant Deshaun Briggs, Staff Sergeant Carl Ennis, Captain Andreas O'Keefe, Master Sergeant William Posh, Captain Mark Weber, and his fellow firefighter, fire marshal, and Major Trips Zanitas. This tremendous hero we honor today was gone in an instant leaving a leg legacy of service we must all strive to live up to. Chris was a hero to every life he touched, but most of all, he was a hero to his beautiful young daughters, Eva and Mila. Carmela, you know your husband was a hero. Everyone in this church knows that as well. And I promise you, our department, the entire FDNY, we will always be by your side. Your daughters will know their father was a man without equal, and those who worked with him and loved him like a brother will never waver in their support to his family. 
As a fellow firefighter in Ameren said best, Chris Raguso was a strong man with a gentle soul. He loved his family, he loved the FDNY, and he loved his country. We will never forget him. God bless Lieutenant Chris Raguso. God bless the entire Raguso family. And may God continue to bless the FDNY. I'd now like to introduce Lieutenant Christopher Gazinski. Carmela, Mila and Eva, Mark, Laura and John. Our firehouses have stood with you in support and mourning these past 16 days. Together we have laughed and we have cried in the remembrance of Chris. We have walked through our days numb and empty and have asked ourselves, how can we possibly heal from this? A few days ago you heard what Chris meant to Engine 249 and Ladder 113 and who he was in our lives. Today, through this honor you have bestowed, we again stand with you, only this time his brothers want the whole country to hear him. We want the city of New York and Long Island to hear us when we tell them how our gentle giant was the best they could ask for. He was focused and driven and consistently worked to improve himself to be even better. We want them to understand this man's entire life was dedicated to service of others and he has done exactly what they and the country have asked of him. That's because Chris didn't know how not to give 100% of himself. He recognized that to be good at his job, he needed to go where the action was. He wanted to be there. Whether that was home, wrestling his giggling daughters, or forcing entry into the heart of a six-story tenement on fire. But we don't mourn that part of Chris. That part we can accept. Just look at any picture and you'll see the widest smile on his face. He loved doing what he did. See, we don't define Chris by his job, his resume, or his awards. To us, Chris is his legacy of family and friends and the thousands touched by him. Today we can look around, we can see an amazing family, an army of friends, two firehouses, entire departments, and a whole country crushed by the loss of Chris. We can listen to all the previously untold stories of one of his expressions of concern, acts of kindness, or acknowledgments when no one else remembered, and take in just how outstanding this man was. And we can look upon his wife and two wonderful daughters and remember that nothing mattered to him more than they did. That is some legacy. We mourn Chris because of who he was. We mourn the man who would send you random messages letting you know he missed you. We mourn the bear hugs and endearing nicknames he gave each of us. We miss the innocent goofball antics we now can only tell in stories and laughter. We miss the man who would try to be mad at you, but quickly forgave, because that was just his nature. We long for one more chance to break his chops. His reactions were priceless. You stop it. You stop that right now. <laughs> he would whisper with a big grin as he realized the joke was on him. And we wish we could hear one more dramatically exaggerated story he was just bursting at the seams to share. <laughs> when men like Chris pass, we're forced to reflect on our own worthiness. Deep down, we know we will never measure up to the bar he has set. Chris just gave us so much more than we gave him. When he deployed, he said he had to go, because if he didn't, someone else had to. He knew it could be someone else here today. 
and he knew that it would be one of his friends. A man has no honor, lest he is willing to die for those he loves. Carmela, in a few minutes, you're going to leave this church, and you're going to see 10,000 plus lining the streets. As you process by, look for Chris standing there in each rank. His cap will be pulled down, his chest will be high, and his hand will be raised to his brow in a firm salute. He will be flanked by another just like him, saluting you and the family who loved him. And when the ranks and columns come to an end, remember that Chris will still be there, standing at a proud attention, forever behind you. Take some comfort in knowing that the years will come and you will get to see him again, as each one of us will form proudly in ranks and columns to salute the man we wish we had one more chance to say goodbye to. Mr. Raguso, you asked that this quote be read, and it would be my honor. I want the world to remember it, for it should only be spoken about men like Chris and those he died with. Out of every 100 men, 10 shouldn't even be there. 80 are just targets. Nine are the real fighters, and we're lucky to have them, for they make the battle. Ah, but the one. One is a warrior, and he will bring the others back. Chris is casting a long silhouette from heaven, and we will forever be walking in it. Forever, Christopher Joseph Raguso. I'd like to introduce Congressman Lee Zeldin. Today we gather to honor the life, service, and sacrifice of an amazing father, husband, son, a firefighter and Air Force brother, friend, neighbor, and our hero, Mass Art Christopher Guso. That others may live. There are no words that would fully describe the profound sadness and immense gratitude that consume all of us here today. There are no words to describe the emptiness that this loss leaves in the hearts of our community and our nation. But there are no shortage of ways to describe Chris, selfless, hero, patriot, everything that we aspire to be as a people, as a nation, and as Americans. As the father of two daughters myself, I look at two beautiful girls, and a great family, and friends, and brothers and sisters. And you can tell today all the confirmation that Chris was everything that we aspire to be in life. He's the embodiment of what makes our nation the greatest in the world. The willingness to make the ultimate sacrifice, not just for friends and family, but for millions of strangers he would never meet. Chris's legacy is one hallmarked by a life of service so that others may live. 
Chris was a leader of the world's most elite firefighting unit, the FDNY. Somehow he managed to find the time to be a leader at the Comac Fire Department. Chris was a leader in the world's elite power rescue unit, the 106th Rescue Wing. A few days ago, I was at the 106th for the arrival of three of the airmen. And I couldn't tell in the ranks of his brothers and sisters who were closest to him and who were most distant, who were most affected by what happened and who may have felt the least impacted because they were all composed in rank, following the orders to stand at attention, to salute, order arms. But when the event was over and the family members were out of sight, once again I couldn't tell who was closest to him and who was most distant, who was most impacted or, or you could say least impacted. Why? Not because they were composed, but because every single one of them broke down and hugging each other. Chris deployed several times. Iraq, Afghanistan, Horn of Africa, and as was mentioned here domestically as well. There is no doubt that Chris and the so many who have fallen before him are the reason why we get to stand here here today. Chris dedicated his life to defending the liberties of which our nation were founded, to defend his neighbors, his community, his friends, but especially the millions of Americans who he would never meet. Each and every one of us is Chris's greatest memorial, a free and safe and grateful people is his eternal monument. Each and every day we wake to a free nation, we owe it to Chris. Every night we return home and embrace our loved ones, we'll thank Chris. We get to live in the most exceptional nation in the entire world with a great flag and constitution and limitless potential and freedoms and liberties because generations of our best of the best were willing to sacrifice it all at any moment so that others may live. Chris's sacrifice and the sacrifice of his family will forever weigh heavy on our hearts. As neighbors and as fellow Americans, we stand shoulder to shoulder with the Raguso family. And everyone who had the privilege of knowing him most closely, to truly know the exceptional man, Master Sergeant Christopher Raguso, who lived every day and every moment of his life with ultimate purpose, so that others may live. Chris's dad, Captain John Raguso. Mr. Mayor, Congressman, County Executive, Assemblyman. I stand humbly before you with the most difficult task of my life. I am challenged to define our son, our brother, husband and father in 12 minutes or less. Talk about a New York minute, Mr. Mayor, huh? This could be a New York 12 minutes. So let's start the journey and I will articulate the many faces of this loving and unique young man. This is Christopher version 1.0 for all you techies out there. 
Christopher J. Raguso was born on March 14, 1979, in Flushing, Queens, <coughs> to a loving mom whose family migrated here from the Dominican Republic in the early 1960s. My parents were also immigrants and came to the United States in 1919 to escape a war torn Europe for a new chance in America. Chris grew up like any other kid on Long Island, going to public school, playing soccer, Little League Baseball, trying to fit into the social fabric of the 1980s. We knew early on that Chris was on a flight path all his own. He was the firstborn and the total focus of our household until his brother Mark came along three years later. Predictably, then and now, Goose didn't like sharing the limelight, as many of you know. After his brother was home just a few weeks, and taking up the majority of his mom's attention, he marched right up to us and said, if we could take that baby back to the hospital, because this one cries to us, and get me another one. So that's classic Chris. As they grew up, Chris loved his brother Mark and was his protector. On more than one occasion, Chris would climb out of his bed at night and would find him sleeping on the floor at the front of his brother's crib the next morning. On one su summer trip down to the Dominican, Laura left six-year-old Chris and three-year-old Mark in the car with the nanny while she went to visit a local church. As is to happen in the DR, cars attract attention, and soon they were surrounded by a dozen local kids. Many of them didn't have shoes or shirts. Much to the nanny's shock, Chris rolled down the car window, took the shirt off his back, and gave it to a surprised but grateful young boy. He then took his, his shorts off and his shoes and did the same. <laughs> but wait, all the food and water that was in the car went next. And when Chris tried to take the clothes off his brother Mark, the nanny dropped the hammer and said, no more of that kind of stuff. I'm sure that nothing got lost in the translation when Laura returned to the car and found Chris in his jockey shorts. Chris got a soft, loving, and compassionate side from his mom, Laura, and those early signs were indicators of what was to come. His love and passion to help others in their time of need was unrivaled. During Chris's high school years in the early 90s, he struggled to understand who he was and who he might be, trying to fit into a rapidly changing world driven by grunge rock, the internet, and changing social norms. Chris played soccer, played in a band, and if the high school graduation was like a leaf blowing in the wind, looking for a spot to land to pursue the next phase of his life. Now this is version 2.0, we graduated. The moment that started a huge shift in Chris's life was meeting up with Harold Rowan from the Nassau County PD. Harold had the patience of a saint and the wisdom and the insight of a big brother that Chris never had. He convinced Chris to join the Comac Fire Department in 2000 as a volunteer, and this seemed to be right in Christopher's wheelhouse. He had a chance to be a part of a proud team and to do good deeds for the community. This new lifestyle gave Chris a sense of purpose, and Chris version 2.0 started to take shape. When Chris had a chance to join my brother Joe, who was a two-star chief at NYPD, much to our disbelief, Chris passed on this opportunity to follow his one true love. He wanted to be a New York City firefighter. He wanted to be one of your boys. He took the FDNY test. He got a high 90 score and waited for his turn to be called. In the interim, Sergeant Harold weave, wove his magic wand yes, once again, it got Chris to interview to be a New York State firefighter at the West Hampton Beach Air Base. Chris joined the New York Air National Guard, went to boot camp, was a squad leader, and came back as an airman first class. Then 9-11 happened, and the entire world changed. Chris spent a year at the Department of Defense Fire Academy and became a certified U.S. Air Force firefighter. In 2004, Chris was sent to the Iraq War with his best buddy, Ed Kelly, 
and they saw the world in a totally different way. Death and mayhem was everywhere. Not back on Long Island anymore, boys. You're in the real world. Then the moment that changes Chris's life forever happened during an attack on their base in Baghdad. Chris and Ed were standing outside of their tent when a mortar round whistled in and landed 10 feet away, but it didn't explode. Chris and Ed hastily evacuated the area, and EOD came by later to detonate the round. It wasn't a dud. The good Lord just decided to spare Chris and Ed at that moment, and that changed everything. This is Chris version 3.0, the wild goose. Chris was a totally changed man when he came back from Iraq. He mentioned something about being the tip of the spear on his next deployment. He didn't want to be mission support anymore. No way. He wanted to be the mission. But that would have to wait. FDNY called. He was in the next class at the Rock in 2005, and they made him a squad leader and gave him a challenge. Pass all 25 of the recruits in your squad, and you can pick your firehouse from any in the city. Hmm. That was all Chris needed to hear. He had his group out there running and practicing their drills each day after class to get them to step it up. He willed them to succeed, and, he, and they did. They all did. All 25 made it, and Chris chose the Rat House, engine 249 ladder 113, as his preferred landing spot, with a little help from his uncle, Vinny Ungaro, who you know passed away last year. His brother Rats didn't know it yet, but the Rat House was never going to be the same. Chris listened and learned from some of the best and most experienced firefighters in FDNY. And like you said, Commissioner was awarded six citations in only his first few years on the job. He even gave up a Class B medal to a brother rat who had promised his dad that he would be a hero one day. That was Chris. Chris looked good in a uniform and wore all three proudly, understanding the history of every service that he served in. In 2007, the Air Force, his sexy girlfriend, convinced Chris that if he re-enlisted, they would send him to helicopter school and get his wings. It was an offer he couldn't refuse. A combat search and rescue aviator. Wow. Chris passed flight school, gunnery school, engineering school, and the dreaded SEER school with flying colors. His graduate class was a five-month tour in Afghanistan. In 2008, we learned firsthand what it meant to, to fly into harm's way and save lives. There were many wounded Marines who were happy to meet Chris and his crew. But before he left, and thanks to the back channel dealings of his mom and BFF Roro, who was out there somewhere, they arranged for Chris to meet the woman who was destined to be the love of his life. Chris did a fire prevention talk in Carmela DTR's classroom one day, and the rest, as they say, was history. It was love at first sight. Carm was, and still is, a stunning beauty, with a unique grace and the most beautiful green eyes on the planet, for sure. I advised Chris with the utmost urgency that this was the woman for him. And for once, the two geese finally agreed on something. <laughs> they secretly got married before he deployed to the stand with the promise of a big church wedding upon his return. And according to Big Tony, it was a fantastic ceremony in April of 2009, and life was good. Chris continued to grow at FDNY, and the student ultimately became a teacher, hoping to train the new recruits in the ways that he was taught by his brother Rats. Giving 99% was slacking off. Chris demanded 110% at all times from himself and his students, and it was contagious. A legend was beginning to take shape. His daughter Mila was born in July of 2011, and now Chris was a proud daddy and a family man. Chris returned to war in 2012 in Afghanistan, where he and his crews once again saved the lives of many Marines who were wounded in battle. When he returned just before Christmas, Carmela gave birth to their second daughter, Eva Rose, and life was great. At the beginning of 2014, Chris started a study group for the upcoming FDNY lieutenant's test, reputed 
to be the toughest civil service exam in New York State. His brother Rats, Chris, Greg, James, and Russell all joined the group, and ultimately all five made the top 50 on the list and received their white, hat, their white hats in October of 2016. Prior to making lieutenant, Chris was called off to war again, and in 2015 fought with the SEALs in Eastern Africa for a five-month tour of duty. That secret war in Somalia that the Times did an expose on. In the summer of 2017, Hurricane Harvey devastated the Houston, Texas area, and the 106th Rescue Wing was called into action. The Jolly Greens flew in 80 knot winds to pluck a total of 654 Houston residents out of the flood zone and bring them to safety. Chris was a big part of that operation, and the GoPro camera he put on his helmet documented his crew's bravery and courage for the entire world to see on the nighttime news. Two weeks later, they followed up the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, rescuing numerous survivors in Puerto Rico, Florida, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. All told, we estimated that Chris and his crews had saved over 400 souls during his 500 hours of flight time. Not a bad ratio, Mr. Mayor. Not a bad ratio at all. Chris's last tour overseas started in January of 2018. He had promised everyone that this would be his last time going to war. How prophetic. He couldn't pass on this since he had a trio of new flight engineers to train up and that this needed to be done in theater. His departure overseas was low-key and devoid of the usual family histrionics. As per his request, it was just him and Carm. We had a FaceTime birthday party for him on the 14th of March, his 39th year on Earth. The next day was to be his last. I'd like to forget that day, the Ides of March, which was the worst moment of my life. He died on a mission near the Iraq-Syria border while supporting coalition forces in the war against ISIS, those people who would eat your children. But why? Why did the Lord God take this young man who was a lifesaver, a difference maker, a leader, a teacher, a fantastic son, a great big brother, a loving husband, and an exemplary father to his girls? Why? The tried expression that only the good die young really hits home here. Chris was a great combination of his mom and his dad. Tough as nails, focused, driven, compassionate, and loving. But why take him? Why not take a drug dealer or a murderer? As they struggle to comprehend the gross unfairness of this catastrophic loss. I have been seeing a strange collection of signs that are beginning to give me some perspective. When we were down in Delaware last week to receive his remains, his buddies from Ladder 113 were out getting gas when a truck in front of them had a large blown up goose in the back looking straight at them. Wow. The helicopter that brought his body back from Dover Air Force Base had a tail ID number of 113, just like Ladder 113 where he served for 13 years. The first C-130 on the flight line, different than the rest, with a bright orange tail, bore the ID number of 302. Engine 302, Chris's next command. But the strangest sign happened the morning that we're going to meet up with Chris. I don't need the notes for this one, gentlemen, the ladies. I went down to the gym to vent my, my anger and my frustration, my disappointment, all those negative things and called on to God to get me out of this mess, get us out of this mess. And some guy walked in the room out of nowhere. I'm on the bike, he's on the treadmill. And after 10 minutes of this, he says, how you doing, buddy? I go, man, I'm in the world of goo, world of goo. He says, what's going on? I said, well, I'm here to see my son come off the plane. He got off the treadmill and he reached through his pocket and as if on cue, showed me a picture on his cell phone, his son Tariq, this big strapping young man, sitting on top of an MRAP with a big 50 in his hand, just like my son had on his helicopter. And 
he goes, this is my boy Tariq. He goes, you know, he's a tough guy. I said, yeah, I can see that. Presses the next picture on the phone. And he goes, this is my boy Tariq. He goes, got a big 50 cow in his hand, muscles on muscles, posing. One more shot on the phone. He goes, my boy Tariq on his motorcycle. And there he is doing a wheelie, with, giving his dad a big thumbs up. So he goes, my son was in Afghanistan, two tours, nine months and 10 months. Kicked butt for his Uncle Sam, I was proud of that boy. He goes, been in a hundred battles, took out a lot of bad guys. 19 months of combat, not a scratch. He says, two weeks after we got back from the stand, he died on his motorcycle. He goes, brother, he goes, my son died for nothing. He goes, your son, he died for something. And then he left. And I'm sitting there, Bishop. I'm sitting there going, what just happened here? So immediately I called an ecumenical convention with the Catholic priest, the Pentecostal minister, and the guy from the church of what's happening now. And the three of us sat around, started off with the Our Father, and I said, gentlemen, this, is, this just happened to me. What does this mean? And the Pentecostal minister was the first to chirp up. He said, brother, he goes, God just talked to you. I go, I think he did. So what does all this mean? The only rationale I can formulate from this tragedy is that Chris, ha Chris had a great story to tell. By taking Chris now, we're all overwhelmed by the loss and the world will see it. Know it, touch it, and cry with us as we feel the pain. His story will be told, and others will be inspired by his selfless deeds as the ultimate three times first responder, and will want to be like him and walk in his shoes. Trade one man for ten, and ten for a hundred. This will make the world a better place, just like Lieutenant Chris did in his life. In retrospect, if the Lord would have taken him back in 2004, none of this would have happened. Chris had 14 glorious years of extra time, and he made the most of it. He lived his life large. His family loved them forever and made the world a better and happier place. He earned every one of those 14 extra years. Yes, he did, and I'm here to tell you that. His legacy is his beautiful wife and their charming girls both of who look and act just like their dad. We are eternally grateful for them and will love and support them to the end of our days. I ask his brother Ratchet and Ladder 113 and the Vipers of Engine 302 and the Colmac Fire Department, any of you guys that are in this church, I want you to rise right now, please. Ladder 113, Engine 302 and the Colmac Fire Department. Brother Rats and Brother Vipers, I want you to make this solemn promise to God in his church, to the bishop, to Chris, to me, and to his family. We must continue to tell his story to his wife and children, to inspire them to be great like their dad, and to remind Carmela, Mila, and Eva that he loved them more than anything and will continue to always be there and love them in spirit. And know this, brothers, Chris will ride with you on every alarm and will be by your side on every call. He will smile with every life that you save. So let's get the big goose ready for his last flight to his final resting place. Help me honor this great man who put it all on the line and let us never forget the ultimate sacrifice he made to protect your families from the wolves. Let's take our brother goose home. Thank you.
we invite our ceremonial officers to lead our uniform personnel forward to form Chris's honor guard. My friends in Christ, as we've gathered this day, we honor a great American, a great man of faith, a wonderful father, wonderful husband, wonderful son. Thirteen years ago, personally, I was uh, serving in Iraqi freedom, and I had received a, uh, an email from uh, an eminent Navy chaplain, and it, I received it on Holy Saturday, and I knew I was going to be gathering with units to, to pray in the hope of Easter, as we were in the midst of the war. And he sent me these words, words that might be familiar. I said, God, I hurt. And God said, I know. I said, God, I cry a lot. And God said, that's why I gave you tears. I said, God, I'm now so depressed. And God said, that is why I gave you sunshine. I said, God, life is so hard. And God said, that is why I gave you loved ones. I said, God, my loved one now has died. And God said, so did mine. And I said, God, it's such a loss. And God said, mine was nailed to the cross. I said, but God, your loved one lives. And God said, so does yours. I said, God, where are they now? And God said, mine is on my right, and yours is in the light. I said, God, it hurts. And God said, I know. One of the members of one of my former units is a New York City fire captain, and he would give me the greeting that meant more to me than any other title in my whole life. He'd say, brother, Today, a lot of brothers and sisters have gathered here to support a wonderful family, a family of great faith and trust in our Lord. And as he was given a great name, Christopher, Christ Bearer, he was a brother to all of us. He will never be forgotten. We will now give our final commendation in faith to our Lord. Before we go our separate ways, my friends, we take leave of our brother. Our farewell will express our affection for him. It will help ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ conquers all things and destroys even death itself.
Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our dear brother Christopher in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, you will rise with him on the last day. We give thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon him in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us, listen to our prayers, open the gates of paradise to your servant, and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are one with our brother forever. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Eternal rest grants unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful pardon. Through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Let us now take our brother to his place of rest.
detail and salute. Coming up! Fight us set up! Smoke! Watch!
family members with pins that brought their private cars. We have vehicles available that will bring you back after the cemetery. We'll be to the left of the church, the north side of the church. There's vans available. So if you brought your private cars and you have a pin, please head over to one of the vans. There'll be members over there to direct you. Family members that came in their private vehicles, we do have extra vans that have room. Kindly of make your way to the left side of the church on Old Dock Road, and they will bring you back to the church after the, after the cemetery. 